I'm going to call tonight's meeting to order. Can we all stand for the flag salute? I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, roll call. Thank you, Ma Mayor. Councilmember Murray. Present. Councilmember Payne Donovan. Councilmember Ryan. Here. Councilmember Sonmore. Here. Cast Mayor Pro Tem Wall. Here. Councilmember Gooder. Present. Mayor Massimuto Wright. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see Councilmember Payne Donovan. Oh, so he'll be. Yeah, he's on his way in. Um, should we just wait for a moment before we go on to? Well, I thought that was him. Yeah. Oh. He's, he's there. He's getting. Well, he just walked through there, so let's go. <laughs> Next is public comment, so I wanted to just. So we're in the middle of roll call. So you want to do that? Present. Council member Payne Donovan. Present. Thank you. All right. So next on our agenda is public comment. Do we have any public comment? Do we have anyone signed up? We do have one person signed up. Please, do you have? Oh. Right now, to do the public comment. Yeah, you have five minutes. Thank you. Hi there. I'm Andrea York, a citizen of uh, Mount Lake Terrace um, and uh, owner of an electric vehicle. So my issues are about parking in this lot very succinctly. Um, I swim three times a week at the pool, so I come here and plug in, walk over, and walk back during those sessions. And on two separate occasions, I came across, number one, um, a white Volkswagen electric vehicle parked in the disabled spot. So I think that the sign says it's a disabled spot and you need a placard, and there was no placard on the car. Um, so... I went to the police station and they told me to come here. I came here and mentioned it that, um, went to the front desk here, that I had an issue with the person parking there without a placard. And she said, well, that's the police department's responsibility. Um, on, on a second occasion, the same white car, when I came to plug in, there was no electric spots available, although there was a cord available um, and the same car, who had been in the disabled spot previously, was in an electric spot in front of the City Hall building, but not charging. So I came into, I could barely plug my own car in, um, but I did get to it. And then I came to City Hall and said, no, I first, I think I went back to the police department. I don't remember the order. Um, but I went to both organizations' front desk ended up back here, um, a woman from the, the second station here at the front desk took my issue, looked up, looked out at the car, recognized it as a city hall employee, and um, tried to make me feel better because whenever I come in charge, it's free here. And I said, that's not the point. Um, we are a very small group of people right now in competition for those slots. And my request to this body or to whomever makes those decisions, perhaps we could start by training the public by putting up a sign. It is a $124 Washington State fine if you're parked in an electric vehicle spot and you're not plugged in and charging. Likewise, I think it's a fine if you're parked in a disabled spot without a placard. There should be a fine. So my request of this group is if nothing else, to please get some signage up before the parade starts. Um, 
and hopefully maybe once in a while eyeball that somebody's really plugged in um, and not abusing it because on that particular day while this woman was sitting in the electric station another charger came in who wanted to run to the library and he too used the disabled spot um, again to run to the library he wasn't disabled but everybody's going to do what they need to do if it's not being used and Certainly, if you work at City Hall, if you don't have front row parking, you could go any place in the lot if you're not charging. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have anyone else? If there are any audience in virtual um, audience would like to speak, please raise hand, raise tool. Going once. Oh, there once. All right. Jim Lawrence, uh, I will unmute you and you will have five minutes to talk. Please state your names and where you live also. Thank you. Yes, hi, good evening. Um, I'm Jim Lorenz with the Volunteers of America, Western Washington. My address is uh, 2802 Broadway Avenue, Everett. Um, I'm here to give an update on our Linwood Neighborhood Center project. Yeah, I, I, it's been a while since there's been a representative from the Volunteers of America that's given a presentation. I think it maybe was even late last year that uh, the last representatives came and, and gave a, an update. So I'm, I'm here to, to give a quick update. We've, we've done a lot since the last presentation. We almost have a building permit in hand. Uh, we've bid the project. We've hired a general contractor uh, who's W.G. Clark, who some of you may have heard of. And um, we've had a lot of interest in the project from potential service providers of, of all of the leasable space in the building, roughly 85 to 90% is spoken for, which is really great. There's been a lot of interest. And, and of that, roughly 37% of the total leasable space is being utilized for, for behavioral health and ECAP. Um, for behavioral health, we have a lot of interest from Center for Human Services and from Therapeutic Health Services. The, the ECAP space will be run by the Volunteers of America, and we're providing 62 full-time spaces, which include 40 preschool-aged children, 14 toddlers, and eight infants. But before we can get the service providers in, we really need to get construction started. And we've been super appreciative of all the support we've had from Legislature D District 32. Uh, recently, Representative Rayu uh, helped us push through a grant from the state capital budget, which was super helpful. I think that the last time somebody from volunteers presented to this council we were asking for a million dollars. And I think that um, some numbers I'm hearing recently are are lower than that, but I came to, to ask if we could maybe achieve $500,000. That would be a huge push for us to get to get the project started. And, um, and it, we'd really, really appreciate that. And so that's, my quick update, if there are any questions for me, I'm happy to answer. This is not a time we can answer uh, ask questions. Okay. That's all for me then. Thank you so much for letting me join you. All right, thank you. Do we have anyone else? Is there any audience in virtual audience would like to speak? Going once, going twice, 
That concludes public comment. Thank you. Thank you. So next on our agenda is um, the consent calendar of the Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Move to approve the consent calendar items A through C. Second. I'll second. Can I second it? But I, I want, I have questions after. Did you want to pull something off before we? Um, I'd like to correct some of the minutes. Um, I'm the, there's some issues with the minutes. Can we do that now, um, city manager, or do we have to? Or I can talk to the city manager on my one-on-one, -on -one. sorry, mayor. Um, but there was just some issues with the minutes. Uh, we have a motion and a second. So at this point, it's appropriate to, um, uh, I think you can discuss what problems are. are. Mm -hmm. Well, let me back up. You can uh, uh, open the floor for discussion, have the discussion now, and then um, uh, move to approve following discussion. Go ahead, Mayor Pratam. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I suggest, I guess, at this point, maybe we pull item B uh, from the consent calendar, allow Council Member Sonmore to uh, make suggestions and, uh, and corrections as needed and put it back on the consent calendar during the next council meeting. I think that would be appropriate. Um, and then, yeah, and then the other two, there would just have to be a second for your amended motion. Second. So we'll consider that a friendly amendment to pull item B from the consent calendar and move forward with the, with the second being appropriate. So we can, so we're voting on items A and C for the consent calendar. So now we vote. <laughs> All in favor. Aye. 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 All opposed. So that motion carries and we're taking the uh, minutes out. And are we going to discuss those minutes this time, or is uh, Councilmember Sonmore going to talk to you about it? I think Councilmember Sonmore can talk to me about it, and we'll put those on your consent calendar for your next regular meeting. Would that be okay, uh, Councilmember Sonmore? All right. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So then uh, next is the first of uh, two proclamations, and the first one is a pride proclamation. And I see some people in the audience out there. I'm going to read it first, and then I'm going to go out there. Do you want me to read it over there? Either. Sure. I can read it here and then. Yeah. Okay. So. <clears throat> the City of Mount Lake Terrace Proclamation Pride Month. Whereas on June 28, 1969, New York City police raided the Stonewall Inn, a gay club located in Greenwich Village, and sparked a riot, leading to six days of protests and violent clashes with law enforcement known as the Stonewall Riots, which later served as a catalyst for the LGBTQ and rights movement and whereas, in honor of the 1969 Stonewall Uprising and the subsequent first Pride March in New York City in June 1970, each June, Americans come together to celebrate and honor the, the L, LGBTQ pl, uh, plus community and whereas since the Stonewall uprising, the a, LGBTQ and community plus community has achieved significant progress, including the right to marriage equality, state and federal workplace protections, and the Hate Crimes Prevention Act. And whereas... We celebrate and reflect upon the courage and accomplishments of the LGBTQ plus community who continue to fight for progress towards securing important rights and freedoms to live freely and authentically. And whereas the LGBTQ plus community has and continues to face systematic discrimination across the United States and whereas the city of Mount Lake Terrace values diversity and inclusion and is, committed to, and is committed to equal rights, justice, and opportunity. And whereas the city of Mount Lake Terrace recognizes the important contributions of its LGBTQ plus residents to this city's history, culture, economy, and civic life. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Kyoko Matsumoto Wright, on behalf of the city of on behalf of the City Council, to hereby proclaim June 2023 as Pride Month in the City of Mount Lake Terrace, signed this 5th day of June, 
2023 at the City of Mount Lake Terrace, State of Washington. Go ahead and um, state your name if you want to, only if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Hayden Studley. I'm a historian for the GSA of Mount Lake Terrace High School. Okay. This mic is sensitive. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm Alexander Kim and I'm the secretary of the Mount Lake Terrace High School GSA. My name is Kyo Peterson. I am the Vice President of the Mount Lake Terrace GSA. I do it? <laughs> um, okay, so GSA stands for Gender Sexuality Alliance, and it pretty much serves as kind of like a community within high schools for LGBTQ plus people to gather and, and <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a safe space for us and we get to do like quite a lot of things, mainly um, just like hanging out and like talking about like things. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a safe space place for us. We've come a long ways. Okay, next is the Juneteenth Proclamation. Councilmember Woodard. It is my honor, Mayor, thank you. City of Mount Lake Terrace Proclamation, let's jump right into it. Juneteenth Independence Day. Whereas President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation took effect on January 1st, 1863, stating in part that, quote unquote, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thence force, thence forward, and forever free. And, whereas it was not until June 19, 1865, that the enslaved people of Galveston, Texas, were at last informed that, quote-unquote, in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free, unquote, and whereas this day and event, recognized as Juneteenth, marks the effective end of chattel slavery in the United States, further codified within the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States on December 6th of that year, and whereas Juneteenth is the oldest observed celebration of the emancipation of enslaved persons in the United States, and whereas Juneteenth National Independence Day became a federal holiday on June 17, 2021, and the crowd goes wild, as well as legal state holiday in Washington on July 25th, 2021, always ahead of the curve. Whereas on May 2nd, 2022, the Mount Lake Terrace City Council adopted Resolution 1863, because we knew it was right, establishing Juneteenth as a legal city holiday, and whereas Juneteenth, like Independence Day on the 4th of July, is a celebration of freedom that is important to our community and country, 
And whereas the city of Mount Lake Terrace officially observes holidays of cultural and historical importance to our community, now, therefore, our mayor, Kyoko Matsumoto Wright, mayor of the city of Mount Lake Terrace, on behalf of the city council, does hereby proclaim June 19th as Juneteenth Independence Day, signed by our mayor of Mount Lake Terrace this fifth day of June 2023, Mayor Matsumoto Wright. Did we want to introduce who is going to be receiving this? I'm William Page, and I am the um, chair of the Mount Lake Terrace Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Commission. And if I may, you know, I was talking to my mother yesterday after this invitation to come and accept the proclamation. My mother is 84 years old, and she lives in Houston, Texas. And her, my grandmother, my mother was born in 1939. My grandmother was born in 1919. My great-grandmother, we called her Mama Dear, was born, I believe, in 1888. They all grew up and lived in Houston, Port Arthur, and Galveston. And so when I told her about this, you know, my mother said something that, you know, I've been thinking about how important this is. She says it's good that the city that you're living in is recognizing how important history is, how it has to be proclaimed, how it has to be talked about, and how it can't be forgotten. So on behalf of the DEI Commission and my three generations of mothers, thank you. Thank you very much. So that concludes our um, proclamations. And, and we're going to move on. But thank you so much for coming. All right. OK, so next is a presentation of the uh, community transit update. And we have some people from community transit here, including the CEO, Rick Ilgen Fritz. And did I pronounce it right? <laughs> Red is on. You did, thank you. Um, well, thanks for having us today. Uh, it's great to be here um, to talk a little bit about transit this evening. I'm joined by Chris Simmons, who is our manager for planning, and Chris will be handling the bulk of the presentation today. Um, but I wanted to give a few opening remarks and, um, and then turn it over to him. Um, we were last uh, together March 7th of last year in a, in a Zoom setting, so it's especially nice to be here in person in this beautiful campus and see you all uh, here in the flesh and be able to talk about the future of this community and the county and the, the work we're all doing together to serve our constituents. And we're, of course, just so fortunate to have the mayor uh, serve on our board. She's there at every meeting. Uh, asking questions, uh, supporting the work we do, and making sure that the concerns of this community uh, are part of our discourse uh, further north. So thank you for that as well. Um, this is a really interesting place uh, to talk about the future of transit. You literally, in the city of Mount Lake Terrace, have a front row seat uh, for what happens out there uh, to the west of us every day. In the morning, you see the traffic build, and every night, you see it build in the opposite direction. Um, and that is a constant uh, that we live with as transit operators, that you live with as city leaders. Uh, Fifteen years ago, uh, in 2008, the fall of 2008, the voters of the region uh, voted to fund a light rail project uh, extending from Seattle up to Linwood. And here we are on the cusp of that project opening next year. And so we have spent the last two years uh, on a public journey with all the communities in Snohomish County talking about how our network uh, should evolve uh, when that system opens. 
uh, to better serve the communities of this county and to provide connectivity to that system and leverage that investment. So here we are, uh, it's about to happen. Um, and big change is right in front of us, literally. Um, the proposition uh, that we entered into with Sound Transit was basically that if mass transit came up the I-5 corridor, we in Snohomish County would shift our network uh, to provide a more frequent, consolidated, more reliable local network uh, to connect our communities to each other and connect the people of those communities to the light rail system. So what's about to happen is we're gonna pull all of our service out of downtown Seattle and out of the university district and away from Northgate. That's about 30% of our service. Beginning next fall, we're gonna redeploy all that service and add some uh, to achieve that more frequent, more reliable, higher quality network within Snohomish County. So the idea here and the theory that we're about to test is more and better transit for everybody at the local level and the regional level. Um, so to just give you a sense of what we're talking about, um, starting next fall and over the next three years, uh, we are gonna take our system from 46 routes today down to 35 routes. But those routes are gonna be higher frequency. They're gonna run later in the day and more frequently during the middle of the day and on weekends. So four spread out, or 46 spread out skinny routes compacted into 35 much higher quality, much higher performing routes. We're gonna increase our service uh, from around 340,000 hours today to about 480,000 uh, in 2027, a 32% increase. Uh, we're gonna open a new BRT line. We're gonna extend our Swift Blue BRT line uh, from Evergreen Way and Aurora over here to the Shoreline Station. Um, and as, uh, as I said, we're gonna have three times the routes we have today that are 20 minute or better frequency, twice the routes that we have today of 30 minute or better frequency, and greater ability to adapt our network to the shifting needs of local communities uh, within, the, within the county. So it's a really exciting time. We ha are excited about it because we have the opportunity to put a better product on the street for our customers and to grow our customer base. And if we've learned anything uh, over the past three years during the pandemic, we found out who relies on transit, who needs transit. And we found out that frequency matters, service quality matters. The better your service is, the more people are gonna use it. Today, in the spring of 2023, almost summer, uh, our BRT service has surpassed pre-pandemic ridership levels, while our commuter service is still about one third of pre-pandemic levels. Now, obviously that has a lot to do with the downtown office market and what's going on down there. Uh, but where service is good, people will use it and they're, and they're, and they're doing it today. So without further ado, Chris is gonna walk through how all of this will affect Montlake Terrace. We're gonna do a route by route deep dive on the five routes that will be serving this community, as well as an overview of the countywide network. So Chris, take it away. Thanks, Rick. Uh, I'm gonna use a baseball analogy here with this, and I apologize, I might hit as well as the Mariners did over the weekend. Um, we're hoping we hit a very good solid double with this plan. I don't want to oversell what we think we've done. Uh, there's still lots of shifting patterns and lots of things yet to be settled in the overall travel market. But we feel like if we've made a very solid contribution to what the next world post pandemic is going to look like and we can learn from this and adjust from it, we'll be in, in very good shape in terms of how we're set up to move forward and move with the public. So Rick brought up the overall increase in frequent service. I'm gonna talk about this in two separate ways just to continue to give you an overall overview. On the left, you'll see our current peak service that we're operating today. The blue lines are those in a 20 or 30 to 30 minute frequency. The gold lines are those that are 20 minutes or less. As you can see, the 20 minutes or less currently are our swift BRT lines, the blue and the green line. Uh, at the end of the implementation of this restructure project, we end up significantly increasing those numbers of routes as we discussed earlier. You can see the geographic coverage there. 
Uh, we encompass 76% more population within our service area, uh, within walking distance, so a quarter mile of that frequent transit, as well as 50% more of the jobs in the county. So at least from a structural standpoint, from a commute setup, we think we've done a very good job in making sure we've connected local users with local jobs and their, their residences. Midday, um, it's a little backed off from the, the peak frequency. That's consistent with what we have so far seen with travel patterns and traffic patterns. However, we've still maintained a much more robust midday service with this uh, service change as well. Uh, just slightly less population and about 10% less, uh, uh, less of the job increase within the walking distance of that frequent transit. Again, a significant improvement from where we stand today. We also uh, brought in a new express network with this plan. Um, I don't wanna say these are commuter routes because they're not. Uh, we've kind of modeled this more off of the Sound Transit Express process of routing. So um, we take the existing commuter network focusing on that peak period travel to and from Seattle, and instead we refocus it on the uh, regional transit hubs that are connections within the county for the most part. Um, some of those are peak only routes. Some of those are really designed to facilitate uh, major travel hub uh, connections for, on an all day basis. Depends on the where and what travel patterns we've seen. Again, this was kind of a resource trade off. We didn't want to lose uh, connections for those folks who needed that higher frequency connection into our transit hubs. Um, and in some cases that really needed to be an all day improvement in order to make that work. So. Uh, I'm happy to answer further questions on that as we, we get to the end, but to give a sense of where that is from a countywide perspective. But what you care about, of course, is what's it gonna mean for, for Montlake Terrace? Um, I always come back to the what's in it for me principle with this. Um, so we're gonna talk about the routes that do touch on Montlake Terrace specifically, uh, Route 102, Route 112, 119, 130, and uh, new Route 909 from the Express Series. Um, I'm not going to touch on Route 111, and the reason I'm not, not going to touch on that is because we're still working on changes on that in connection with King County Metro. Uh, we have found that they have similar issues in connectivity for areas in North Kenmore that we have for the western, or excuse me, the eastern edge of Montlake Terrace, Alderwood Manor, and Briar. And so we are working with them to try and find some cooperative solutions that would uh, make more sense given the difficult travel geography for buses in that overall area. So for the time being, the 111 is gonna remain on its, its current setup, but we are, are looking for improvements to that whole section coming forward. So Route 102, and I'm not gonna read the slides. Um, if somebody needs me to, please raise a hand, virtual or otherwise, and let me know. Um, but we designed Route 102 to be a, a very direct connection between Edmonds Station, the Edmonds Park and Ride, and the Lidwood Transit Center, also providing a very uh, frequent connection. This is one of our frequent routes that we talk about uh, running for every 20 minutes. Uh, you can see how we've, uh, uh, we've put the span in there as well to give you a sense on how we're extending span, not just frequency. Um, I use this route because obviously it touches the northwest corner of the city. Um, but it does create that very frequent connection. And before I go any farther, let me talk a little bit about implementation on this plan. Uh, we call this 2024 and beyond because this is a part that we're not gonna get to immediately. And I'll, I'll reference the timeline a little bit later, but understand this is what we're looking to build to by the end of 2026. Um, I can get into labor and all of the other pieces that come into that. As you know, it's a very challenging environment to hire for transit right now. But this is our end vision approved by our board to be able to say this is where we're going to go and, and how we're going to implement it. But this is one of the, the more frequent routes providing that direct connection. Route 112, it's not a change from the current routing. What we've done is improved the service frequency. So this goes from a 60 minute all day connection up to another frequent route of every 20 minutes, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, that's a significant amount of improvement in terms of frequency and cost from our standpoint. We've also done a lot to improve the weekend frequency. So this is not just uh, what we're looking to do for weekdays, but this is also making sure people can connect on Saturdays and Sundays as well. Uh, this is reflective of a lot of what we've seen with the travel market. 
where Saturdays and Sundays have met or exceeded their pre-pandemic uh, ridership levels. And so we wanna to respond to that and provide that additional uh, capacity for the folks who are making that weekend travel as well. Um, for the young folks in the back, yes, this does go by the high school and yes, your free youth transit pass is eligible to be used on these and any other community transit routes. Talk to your high school if you don't have your ORCA card yet. Route 119 uh, maintains the same route as well, but again, we've increased the frequency on this route. So we've taken it from a 60 minute frequency to a 30 minute frequency. So essentially doubled the number of buses that will be available on this route to be able to make connections. Um, it's a bit of a roundabout. This is serving a couple of different markets, but it does create connections up to the Ashway Park and Ride for a number of other connections that aren't necessarily available at the Montlake Terrace Transit Center. Route 130 is similar to what we're doing today, but uh, we've moved it in the admin section of the route. Again, we've improved our midday frequency, our weekend service on this route, and it does create a connection between uh, the Aurora Village Transit Center for travel in uh, uh, North King County uh, while walking through the Montlake Terrace Transit Center and then back up to the Linwood Transit Center through the city. So again, an increase in frequency, an increase in the ability to travel, and that's not just on weekdays or for the commutes, but that is seven days a week. Uh, route 909, this one's a little tricky to explain, but uh, this is one of the routes that we are testing. We have heard for years on uh, people trying to make a much uh, better, cleaner connection between the Edmonds to Kingston Ferry to our commuter buses. And while our commuter buses are going away, the need to connect to downtown Seattle from that ferry is not. And so what we are trying to do with this route is encourage walk-on use, a direct connection to light rail, and the ability to maintain that commute without having to use your car. Um, what we have done is created a peak direction route that is timed to the ferry so a 50 minute headway is an extremely odd headway for those who are used to, to riding transit, but it matches the ferry schedule. And so our hope is you will be able to walk off of the ferry, be able to get on Route 909, take a direct bus over to light rail, and then be able to take link to your final destination. Uh, it is headed from Edmond Station to the transit center at Montlake Terrace in the morning, uh, and then essentially midday reverses and begins to run from the transit center back out to the ferry. Again, same thing with the weekends. We've kept this on the same on a, a similar routing schedule uh, seven days a week. Again, that's also an improvement from weekend or weekday only service that we're running now. Admittedly, this route is a test. Uh, we do not know how this is going to be responded to. We think favorably given the previous uh, community comments that we have received, but we don't know yet. So uh, we're admitting we're gonna learn with this one and uh, we're hoping we've put something out there that's gonna be attractive. And if it doesn't work, we'll, we'll change to try and make it work for those riders as quick as we can. Let me talk a little bit about that timeline that I mentioned earlier. Um, we have already had our board approve this transition plan and we deliberately took it out to 2026 because we know with the challenging labor environment for hiring for transit, that we're not gonna have all of the coach operators and mechanics we need starting tomorrow to be able to implement the full plan. So we wanted to give ourselves some runway to be able to implement the full thing, but we didn't want the community to not know we were, where we were going with this either. So we've asked our board and, and they've graciously agreed to uh, give us the runway to take the uh, frequency and our, our expansion out to 2026. Additionally, uh, our compatriots at Sound Transit are still working through their final plans for what the launch of uh, Linwood Link would look like, both in terms of uh, capacity, frequency, uh, an actual launch date would be nice. Um, and, and we wanna be able to respond as they finalize their plans. So what we are doing is um, we're planning for very little change this year to allow us to build our roster up and prepare for next year's changes. Uh, we will be, we are planning on launching the uh, Swift Orange Line BRT with our March service change next year and implementing the associated route changes with that. 
Uh, the 112 would be one of those that would change with the orange line. And then our best understanding is that light rail would be opening in September of 2024 to Linwood. And with that, we want to be ready to implement the remainder or the remaining majority of our service changes by the route structure. So that's the point at which we would be removing the commuter routes and implementing our new express routes. So we want to be prepared for that, but we also want to acknowledge that the capacity of Linwood Link is not going to be 100% of what was originally promised when it opens. That's not just an issue of uh, the connection going across Lake Washington on I-90 and their rebuild issues there, but also a question of how much storage capacity and, and uh, maintenance capacity and additional cars they need in order to be able to run the service to Linwood in the first place. They frankly don't have enough room to store everything they would need to run the promised level of service. So we are anticipating what that's going to look like. We're working very closely with Sound Transit, but we want to give ourselves the room to be able to say that might not all happen on day one with Linwood Link. So that's why I've got the launch window in this particular slide, um, allowing for the potential for change. And then our intent is to continue to build our frequency as we've got the, the roster available to do that until at uh, no later than our uh, September 26 service change We've got everything out there that's in our full plan. Um, all that will be able to be followed along on our website, uh, communitytransit.org slash transit changes. Uh, that page is getting updated to reflect that this is a past uh, proposal and that we are going to be implementing in stages and keeping the public updated. But we wanted to make sure that you had a full sense of, of what we we're looking to change in, in your community and then uh, kind of the timeline that we were looking at. And from there, be available to answer any questions. Do we have any questions, comments? Oh, do we want to go to Councilmember Payne Donovan first and then Murray? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, good to see you, Rick and, and Chris again. Um, I just want to express my, my personal excitement. I think the first um, ballot I ever cast was for ST2 uh, back in the day, so uh, odd to be sitting here reflecting on that. but. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation, and um, also want to uh, say that I will dearly miss my beloved 413 when it goes away. Um, but but more to to this plan and you know understanding the sort of fluidity of of this situation we find ourselves in. Um, would would love to hear more about sort of the the outreach and and planning that that you're doing um, to you know whether it's for for this current plan or or in the future as, as you have to to pivot and. And modify things. How how does CT sort of uh, build its its systems to best serve the, the folks who most need transit for for survival, um, you know, for for work, for school, um, those who don't have cars, et, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you for the comments and thank you for your vote. <laughs> Back in the day, that was my organization. Uh, and it's uh, going to be historic when it all comes uh, into service. Um, I'll, I'll answer how we prepare for the service changes at a high clip, and, and Chris may want to supplement my initial responses. But we used um, the Northgate opening um, as sort of a beta test to prepare for the Linwood Link opening. Uh, we had a limited number of changes to our services at that time uh, that had been serving the university district. Um, and you know, we were able to implement those changes and uh, prepare our customers for those changes and then monitor and adapt as needed uh, once that system opened and we made the shift. Um, admittedly, what we're talking about with Linwood Link opening um, is a significant order of magnitude more complex for community transit than the North Lake or Northgate uh, opening was because it really is shifting our entire network. Uh, fundamentally in a way that we haven't seen in 46 years of, of service. Uh, so two, two things. Um, one of the practices I brought with me from Sound Transit was, was an activation uh, practice. So we, we have an a orange line activation team that is standing up as we speak uh, that will also oversee uh, activation of the new network. We're treating it like a new system. 
And so that includes uh, multiple uh, components uh, of internal preparation, uh, training, all of the necessary disciplines, our operators, our dispatchers, supervisors, security personnel, uh, customer service, uh, also a significant communications and outreach component uh, that will involve uh, active outreach and how-to videos and YouTube and TikTok and all those things to, to reach our customers ahead of time, uh, to educate them about the changes that are going to take place uh, and how to use the new routes, how to make new transfers at the rail stations, for example. Um, and uh, particularly with a targeting emphasis on uh, our ADA and um, uh, disproportionately impacted customers who may need extra help. Um, we have an interesting subplot with all, within all of this, which is that we're rebuilding uh, our customer-facing ride store at the Linwood Transit Center as all this is unfolding. Uh, our goal, uh, the one that Sound Transit shares, is to have that facility uh, rebuilt, expanded, and ready uh, the day uh, Linwood opens. But between now and then, it's going to be at a temporary location at the Ashway Park and Ride at the at the little strip mall across the street. Um, so we have a whole customer outreach plan associated with helping our customers through that change to the temporary location and back to the new location. So I, I won't talk a whole lot longer just to indicate to you that there's a very intentional layered approach to this uh, that very much relies on preparing our customers in advance for the changes and then monitoring the system once the changes occur to help them adapt. Great. Thank you. Did I miss anything? Uh, I think one part. So let me let me grab on that. Um, you know, this plan was approved after three rounds of public outreach over two years. Uh, we started in 2021 asking for what people wanted to see out of the new system. We went back in 2022 and we said, hey, we've got a, a system we'd like to run in front of you. What do you all think? Um, and that was done with a uh, equity lens in mind, uh, kind of patterned off of uh, King County Metro, but we built our own. Um, there's actually a score that we associate with each route that determines a uh, number of uh, individuals who are more transit oriented than not, whether it's low income or uh, car, no car depend or uh, lacking cars or uh, uh, are transit dependent in some way, ADA communities, all that gets baked into a score route by route. So that when we went out in 2022 with the, the full plan and got the public feedback, we were able to take those scores and say, where does it make more sense for us to apply resources as opposed to in other areas? So we've, we've taken a very data-driven approach to this. Beginning in 2023, when we went in for final approval, this was the, the path where we said, okay, this is it, last call. Um, I believe in total we received something in the neighborhood of 1,500 to 2,000 comments over the course of our public outreach. I know at least for the second phase, I literally read every single one of those comments. So you and your fellow members on the 413 uh, are joined by all of the riders on every single 400 route asking for their continued use of a single seat ride into Seattle. We don't get the benefit if we provide that, so um, we're going to try and do the next best thing and, and provide the best service in Snohomish County that we possibly can to connect to the light rail. So I'd say that's part of what I would offer in terms of how we planned to this. Uh, in terms of the communications, I would also offer that we are looking, whereas we would normally do about a month's worth of warning uh, for folks on a service change, we're looking at at minimum doubling that. So a two month outreach process to make sure that everybody is educated as we get into the service changes. It's kind of a dicey balance. You don't want to go too early because then people get confused and think it's happening tomorrow and you've got to educate them back to say, no, here's when it's happening. Versus the people who are, let's just say, asleep on their commute in, miss all of the notices, and we need to continue to re-educate, and there are still some folks who are gonna be surprised on day one of a new network. But uh, overall, we're, we're taking a very deliberate approach to extend our normal outreach process to make sure that as many people in the community as, are informed as we could possibly make happen. All right, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you both for, for being here and, and for the presentation and all of the intentionality and work 
uh, that's going into it. I'm super excited, I think, to your point, where service is good, people will use it. And so hearing about kind of the expansion in frequency and the span of, of those routes is, is really exciting. Uh, to follow up on Councilmember Payne Donovan's question about the 413 and some of those, uh, I guess maybe first my, my Okay. Maybe not serious, but kind of serious questions. So where are the double-deckers going? For those of us that enjoy those, uh, both for commutes and maybe to take our kids on adventures, uh, where, where can we find those once those routes go away? So they will be used on the new express routes. Um, I have a sense of where they're going to go, so let's talk later. <laughs> but um, it, it's not anything formal or official in our blocking process yet. But. Yeah, they're, they're going to be, be used around. on our express routes at a minimum, um, and, and we know they're going to be well used for all of those purposes <laughs> as a result. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, and I guess just to make sure that I'm clear, when we're talking about those routes going away, those will not go away until the light rail is operational and in service. Like, that's not going to be like a September 1st change mm -hmm. and then light rail opens mid-month or something like that where we leave folks kind of in correct. a lurch correct. for a couple of weeks, correct? Yeah, no Lucy and Charlie Brown with the football here. We're <laughs> um, that's part of why we were hedging a little bit on, uh, we don't have an official opening date for light rail yet. Um, they have a they have an opening window kind of like you see on the chart here that sort of encompasses uh, July to the following spring um, they're managing multiple issues but no we won't do the switch over until we're sure we have light rail service I would also add that uh, because we're not sure yet what the frequency of the light rail service will be uh, sound transit is actively uh, looking at supplemental express bus service in the corridor. Uh, we are their express bus provider, uh, and some of the double-deckers are Sound Transit Express uh, fleet, as you know. So there's a possibility that some of the ST Express routes in the corridor, corridor will remain uh, or may be uh, adapted, depending on what conclusions Sound Transit draws about their need for additional capacity in the corridor. So that'll be part of this as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then a couple other quick questions, or maybe not quick questions, um, but I'm curious, you talked about kind of making sure that cu current customers know about the changes that are coming, but I guess I'm curious as we think about our community and really a dramatic shift in how we can potentially travel around the region, um, I guess I'm curious what work is being done to help set up folks who aren't currently transit users, so folks who don't have an ORCA card and don't know how to get one or where to get one, like how are we helping them to, to connect with that resource and get set up for success? So I think the first piece is kind of the marine mantra of leave no one behind. And I, I, that's the part obviously we're gonna be focusing on, but our uh, crack marketing team, and I do use that very advisedly, is working on a number of awareness campaigns to be running through 2023 and 2024, uh, directing folks to where they can get that information uh, I believe if you're in any of the local movie theaters, you may have seen in the previews one of our uh, stop motion animation clips, which is phenomenal. Um, for the youth, I know there is a marketing campaign that is out on the street now um, that will hopefully inform them on, on the reasons for getting an ORCA card and actually tapping it while they're out and using the buses. Um, so there, there's a number of pieces we're going to continue to roll through over the next, frankly, three years as we continue to inform the community about where they can get this information and how they can take advantage of this new system. That's awesome. Thank you. And I guess then I would just make a plug. So you mentioned the Route 111, um, and I think I'm excited to hear about kind of, again, some of the, the increase in services, particularly since we have some of our, our high school students here today because we host the district STEM program here in Mount Lake Terrace. Uh, and I have definitely heard stories from, we have a fairly big school district, right? So we have kids that are commuting from, you know, Northwest Edmonds, and I, I've heard stories about the, the length of time because we don't provide bus service to those kids that are making the trek, so they use public transportation uh, to, to do so. And so I've heard the, about the length of time it takes some of those kids to, to get to school in the morning and, and home in the afternoon, being upwards of like an hour, hour and a half to cross the district. And so excited about maybe some of the high school timings that maybe hopefully we'll get kids, you know, to able to sleep in a little bit more and maybe home a little bit sooner in the afternoon. I guess my plug with the 111 is there's not currently any service to our middle school, which from an accessibility standpoint uh, is a challenging one, both for students and for families that don't have vehicles. And so the 111 gets sort of close. It's like, 
I don't know, three quarters of a mile, a mile. I mean, it's a little bit of a walk, um, but there's no service to that. So I guess just keeping that in mind as you're having those conversations with Metro, it would be really nice to give our young folks who are old enough to be independent, but not drivers as well as families, particularly here in Mount Lake Terrace and you know, kind of our surrounding areas whose kids go to that school who don't have vehicles, uh, the ability to access you know, the programs and the resources uh, of, of that district resource. So I guess I would just put that in as a plug as you're having those conversations that that I think is a gap. And I think back to kind of talking about if service is good, people will use it. I think there's opportunity there that we're not currently realizing. So just, we're aware of that issue. Um, what I will say is not to, uh, I'm gonna use the phrase, I'm sorry, I can't help myself, not to throw your neighbors under the bus, <laughs> but um, the, the city of Briar, the Alderwood Manor area, um, and Kenmore all have similar difficult geographies for us to be able to, to traverse with a, a traditional 30 or 40 foot bus. There's lots of places we simply cannot run a bus and make service happen. So we are looking at what we can do that is something other than the 30 or 40 foot bus that would allow for service to connect places like the middle school with the rest of our service area to be able to create those connections to allow those folks a, a better opportunity. Awesome. I'm glad, I, glad it's on the radar and really appreciate all of the work and intentionality. And again, just super excited about some of these changes and what it means for our community. So thank you. Do we have it? Uh, Councilmember Woodard. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Would you mind rolling back to slide four? I'm more of a visual person. I have a lot of comments, but not much time, so I'm just going to boil it down to thank you. Uh, and I think slide four covers why I'm saying thank you um, when you get there. Uh, yep, that's one. Oh, one more back. Other way. Yeah, right there. Perfect. Yeah, this thing. Yeah, okay. No, no, one more. No, no, the AM, PM. That one. There we go. That's the one. Yeah. I'd really. Again, just thank you for living up to what I hoped was going to happen and what clearly you have even gone beyond what I was thinking you were going to do with that money. And I hope folks can really appreciate uh, the slide on the, or the portion on the right, our right, stage right, I guess, where it's the, what's coming. I just want to plug how beautiful our county is, and it just hasn't really been accessible to folks. And I'm just super excited to see all these cities that Honestly, I didn't know existed before I started working where I work now. And now I spend a lot of time out in Granite Falls and Arlington and Lake Stevens. And there's just a lot of cool stuff out there. But equally as important, cool people that can come the opposite way to our city. I'd, and the youth sitting behind you, I'm super excited for you all. Because by the time you get to our age, this thing is going to be unbelievable. <laughs> You'll be wondering why we even had cars in the first place. Is what I would like to think is going to happen. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's just super exciting to see the connectivity and reaching places that I know struggle and have been left behind that are growing exponentially as well and have all their own needs out there. Uh, but again, just that going back and forth that's going to open up. Um, and I've only been thinking about it from light rail's perspective. So to now see community transit's perspective is even better. Uh, that said, let me throw a loaded question here that you can honestly say, not today, we'll answer that another day, which is Everett. I had heard you all were looking at Everett's uh, wonderful system that might be in need of some assistance. So I, I wasn't sure if that's in these plans as well, or if that's one of those. Let's have that discussion a different day. I'm very comfortable with that answer too. Uh, I can give you an update. Um, it's probably a little bit of both. So uh, for those who aren't aware, uh, about a year and a half ago, the city of Everett uh, approached community transit with a request to collaborate on a study of what it might take to integrate Everett Transit and community transit into one agency. And so uh, we have been working collaboratively uh, with the city staff uh, since then to develop essentially a draft integration plan uh, that addresses uh, first and foremost the potential to increase and improve uh, service within the city of Everett and also from within the city of Everett to destinations outside and vice versa from, from for folks who work in Everett, a better connectivity into the city. Um, also addressing capital facilities, uh, staffing, uh, admin, back of the house, revenues, all that stuff. So we're fairly well into that work. Uh, we have a joint policy committee uh, made up of three members uh, from our board of directors, uh, and then the mayor and two members of the Everett City Council. Um, 
we are meeting with them about monthly, sometimes every other month. And uh, our goal is to present that plan to the city for its consideration uh, when those members deem it ready uh, so that the city of Everett can deliberate and decide whether they want to uh, proceed. Uh, if they decide they do, then it would essentially be an annexation vote uh, that would be um, requested by the city, uh, referred to the ballot by the CT board, um, and the, the vote would be on the integration plan, essentially the service levels and the tax increase necessary to, to implement that. Uh, there is a difference in the sales tax rate collected in the city of Everett uh, versus community transit, and, and the annexation vote would be to, to true up uh, Everett to, to our level. So uh, that's kind of bumping along, but it, it is active, and it is an active conversation. It's probably advanced further uh, than it any point in, in prior years uh, of talking about it. So uh, we'll, we'll keep you posted. Perfect, thank you. I, and I'll just leave my comments with comments I've said before. I am your hype dude. You don't pay me, but I love the services. And when you start to roll this out, if you need some firsthand testimonials or want to follow a camera around people doing this, the mayor I even think would jump in on this. My family connected with her on the light rail just coincidentally, but it's one of those where we actually use the system. So we can give you some firsthand information and I suspect we'd be happy to use our platforms to get that word out. Speaking for you, Mayor, because I know you love the system too. Wow, yeah, I, I run into so many people I know on light rail, even um, people who work here in the city. So, um, anyone else? Because I have questions. Do you want to go, Mayor Potamo? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, I, yeah, I really wanted to let, let you go, uh, because what I was interested in, I, first of all, thank you for being here, and we are all excited about the future of Mount Lake Terrace and, and the service that we're going to have in and around and about, um, and really going to be interested in how this, this new, the new routes and the new service provides accessibility for our citizens. So we'll be anxious to see how it comes together and how we can work together to, to um, make it all work for everyone. Um, but I was in, really interested in the next slide. I didn't want you to walk out of here without us addressing the zip pilot service and, and what, uh, what possibility, how, how it's working since uh, it was first implemented in 2022, not long ago, uh, and, and where it's going and what the possibilities are for the future. We can, if, if you were planning on getting to that, once we were done with the first round of questions, great, but I didn't want to let you walk out of here before I lost the opportunity to ask about it. Sure. <clears throat> so we anticipated the question might come, and it sort of dovetails off your question, Council Member Murray, about how are we reaching other folks uh, who might not necessarily have service. So uh, ZIP is a pilot service currently operating in the city of Linwood. Um, we are planning three additional pilot projects uh, currently uh, with the city of Lake Stevens, uh, the city of uh, Arlington, and uh, the city of Darrington. And we've chosen those four cities because they represent economically and demographically the spectrum uh, of communities within Snohomish County. We've got a rural community, a small town, a medium-sized town, and for us, a large city with Linwood. Uh, so our goal is to innovate uh, with demand response service uh, to essentially try to solve the proverbial first mile, last mile um, transit connection issue that so many people uh, experience. We've done, I've done decades of customer surveys uh, for transit, and there are themes that are there in every survey, and the top two concerns are usually safety and convenience. And so this is an attempt to address the latter. Um, we got a CMAC grant, uh, thank you, uh, for a million dollars to help fund this. Um, but essentially what it is, is a service, uh, an on-demand service, very much like a, a TNC uh, type company, Uber or Lyft. Uh, it operates only within the blue shaded area that you see there. Uh, that area and the service characteristics were developed in a joint process with the city of Linwood very much like the ones we're in now with Lake Stevens and, and Arlington and Darrington. Uh, and we provide point-to-point -point service anywhere within that blue zone um, a customer would like to go uh, for the price of the bus fare in that area. Uh, we accept Orca cards, 
cash, bus tickets, what have you. Uh, any, any, any media that would be used to access a CT bus works on, on ZIP. Uh, unlike most uh, microtransit services, um, it is a point-to-point -point service. It's not point-to-zone, it's not point-to-bus, it's anywhere within that area you want to go. Uh, and our theory here is that by providing a convenient service, um, we will entice people to use the transit system. So you'll see on that map at the south end, uh, where we include the Linwood Transit Center at the north end, Swamp Creek Park and Ride, and along the west border, uh, the Swift Blue Line. And then, of course, local routes within. Uh, what we're finding, it's been operating about six months, um, seven now, uh, is that the Linwood Transit Center is the most popular destination. Uh, but trips are being booked throughout the zone. Um, and they're being used by seniors, by kids, by folks with disabilities, by regular bus riders. Uh, over half are, are trips to transit. Uh, the other half are point-to-point -point trips within the zone, doctor's appointments, shopping, what have you. Um, so it's working very well. Uh, we've carried 16,000 individual rides so far since opening this last September. And so we're learning a lot. Um, we're going to do the next three uh, over the next year into 2024. Um, and we're going to pull together the body of knowledge that we're learning as we do and try to figure out what will work to scale out to the whole county. Um, so, you know, Mount Lake Terrace is very much an interesting market because you have the light rail station uh, and because you have a limited arterial network. Um, it could be a service that would attract new customers to transit, whether they're coming to us or whether they're going to the light rail system. So uh, maybe not today, uh, but at some future point, uh, as we learn this, um, you know, we want to be innovators on the leading edge uh, of, of transit best practice in the country. We want to be the best medium-sized transit agency in the country if we can get there. And if we can dial this in and figure out a way to make it financially sustainable, um, you know, we think it's got a big role to play in the future of rebuilding the transit market share. So thank you for asking. Um, it's a work in progress. Thank you. I, I, I think it is a brilliant concept and I'm really anxious to see that come to Mount Lake Terrace. Um, so be interested in hearing updates as we go along and, and how it's playing out and what we, what, if there's anything we can be doing as a body to help encourage you and bring that service to our citizens. Um, just out of curiosity, how, do you have any idea what kind of numbers, uh, how many of our citizens use uh, CT? Um, do we, do we I'll have any? ask Chris if he knows, but before I pass the mic, just on the last question, uh, we'll be, we're in the process right, of right now of preparing our formal evaluation of the ZIP pilot. We'll be reporting that to our board of directors on, at our August board meeting. So that'll be the next formal update. And, and, then, and then just also this fall, our long range plan will include um, more conversation. Right. Okay, very good. Yeah, just uh, yeah, anxious to hear more about that and, and how it, and, and what kind of time frame we might be looking at for when you might be able to expand the service to whether it's countywide or just not like terrorists and include us in that planning. We're looking forward to hearing more about that. I, I'm sorry. Anyway, numbers. Yeah, numbers. Um, I don't have anything specific that would say Mount Lake Terrace residents per se. Uh, we can get back to you with uh, stop level usage, which is kind of a heuristic to say if they can walk to the stop, then they're right. probably a resident in that area. We can get back to you with that. That it, it gets way down in the weeds and at a level I don't look at unless I'm looking at changing a route. So we'll get back to you with that. Appreciate it. Thank you. I will tag on to my opening comments that um, the Swift Blue Line and the Swift Green Line are back above pre-COVID levels. Um, our corridor level service like the 201, 202, those, those heavy corridor routes are at about 75%. Uh, so you can use that as a proxy to think about where we are as a as a system, uh, working our way back to uh, 2020 levels. I, um, I had a question about, well, a comment about the zip card if it, when it gets to Mount Lake Terrace, because we're having our light rail station 
And uh, it seems, and then we have a, a transit center with parking, and it seems that historically, um, over 50% of the people who park in that parking lot lives within one half mile. So if we can have a zip service a, a half a mile around our light rail station, that will probably free up a lot of cars to our um, transit center. So it's, it's something to think about, and we really, you know, it's, it's such a great idea. I couldn't agree more, and you know, the blue shaded area you see is basically a three square mile area, and, and we think one of the keys to making a service like this work is, is how you draw that service territory to keep it dense enough for the cars to be working all day and mm -hmm. develop that efficient cost per I, I see the zip cars often, and I get excited when I see one. I think I've come a, on a different route here. Um, in my youth, I probably wouldn't even have noticed them. Anyone else before we move on? Do you have more? We're at the end? Okay, I mean, we I'll... could talk about transit all night, but, you know, I know you have other I business. Have, I have so. one more then. <laughs> uh, in the future, when, we, um, when light rail is, is there and so forth, is there any way that we can connect Everett to South Lake Union and use our flyer stop in the middle of our Mount Lake Terrace station? Because the South Lake Union, and especially to Seattle Center, it is not easy to get there, and a lot of people don't want to take the monorail. I don't know why, but, uh, but that just takes you to the Seattle Center. But if you work at Amazon, if you work at any of those areas, there's Google, apparently, and Facebook, and, and so forth, all down in that area. They, they don't have a direct route. Yes, it won't be a light rail route, but it will be a route where they don't have to change um, well, they don't have to get on the, uh, on the, um, the South Lake Union trolley to get over to the South Lake Union. Um, it, it, it's just, it's just going to make life easier for so many people. Um, and I know, I know quite a few people in Mount Lake Terrace work in uh, South Lake Union and in Everett and Linwood and, and so forth. And so, um, even though you're going to be getting rid of your commuter ro routes all the way into Seattle, this is one that I've been talking about for a while, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, still a needed, it's still a needed route. And light rail is not going to cover everything. Light rail is not going to get you, well, once you get the arms going. But for right now. Right. The longer term vision is there would be a light rail station in South Lake Union, so it would be a Westlake transfer. But between now and then... Um, you know, I mentioned we're going to be shifting our network, as we've shown. Uh, we will continue for the foreseeable future, at least, to, uh, to operate Sound Transit Express service uh, for them. They've asked us to consider certain things, and they're in a process right now to determine what kind of express bus service they want to supplement the light rail system with. So I, I don't want to speak for them but as their contractor, but uh, that's an active discussion, and uh, I'm sure they're going to draw some conclusions, you know, between now and next fall about what kind of ST Express service they'll use to augment the, the rail system. All right. Anyone else? Well, I want to thank you guys for coming. And um, I, I really like being on the, uh, the board. I, I learned so much wish that um, everyone else could be listening in on, on some of the decisions that we, um, that we have to make. And the fact that you keep, um, um, uh, what, what do you call that, um, giving accolades to people who work there at every meeting and so on and so forth. So, Well, thank you so much for having us. It's a labor of love, and it's just so nice to be able to come to a council uh, populated with active transit users and uh, appreciate being able to help you guys get around on your trips and uh, look forward to doing more of it in the future. All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Great. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. 
Okay, so next on our agenda is the city manager's report. Thank you very much, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. Just a couple of things for you tonight. Uh, first, I wanted to um, highlight and celebrate the uh, seniors at the Mount Lake Terrace High School. Uh, there are quite a few things that are happening that have happened over the course of their high school experience that are different from what many of us experienced, uh, and they should be congratulated for not only making it through that and continuing uh, the, the high school education, but uh, just surviving in the environment that we've been dealing with the last several years. So congratulations to them. They, uh, they should be very proud of themselves for that. Uh, next, I wanted to mention, and I neglected to mention at our last meeting, and I apologize for that, but uh, the letter from Doris Cannon that was uh, forwarded to you, uh, uh, all of the council members read that, but I did not mention that at a public meeting, so I wanted to make sure I mentioned that tonight. And lastly, uh, we have a couple of new arrivals. Uh, there are new signs, new signage uh, for the police department and the rec pavilion. Uh, and we're gonna look into one, getting to one for this building as well, that uh, say the word welcome in many different languages. And I think it's an important symbol and a, 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 a piece of art that we can uh, hang on the walls uh, of our civic building to make sure everybody in our community feels comfortable engaging with their local government. I think that's incredibly important. I shared some pictures with you. They'll be hung up soon, uh, but uh, we're gonna look into getting another one for this building and uh, we'll be able to see it when we walk in the doors here for council meetings. And that's all I have for you this evening. Happy to answer any questions if you have any. Are there any questions? Go ahead, council member Morrell Woodard. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, City Manager. Uh, where did the idea come from for the welcome signs? That uh, actually came from uh, Mr. Page from the DEIC. And uh, I, thank you for mentioning that. I <laughs> um, uh, didn't, but I uh, wanted to thank Mr. Page for uh, that contribution. And uh, I think it's a, a great piece of work that came out of the DEIC that we you know, might not have thought about, but, uh, but they did. And I think it's a welcome addition to the community. All right, anyone else? Okay, and we'll move on to the council liaison reports. And I guess I will start to my left, and so Council Member Woodard. Thank you, Mayor. I also think you knew I had a long list, so you were like, get him out of the way first. Uh, let me apologize to our city clerk. You're gonna have a lot to write. So I'm just gonna go, because we've been apart for about three weeks. Uh, Thursday the 18th, I had the opportunity to participate in Passport to 2044. I know a number of you did as well, so I'll leave that there in case you wanted to hype that. Uh, that evening, I also had the opportunity to attend the Housing Hope Gala. I'd, I would, and I think others on this council, would love to see a relationship fostered between Housing Hope or Hope Works um, in particular uh, around affordable housing and all that. So I'll just leave that there just to know that they're doing some great work in that come back up in my report. Uh, the next week on the 22nd, Monday, I had the opportunity to visit one of those beautiful cities that I was talking about, uh, CT is going to make sure we start seeing more of, which was I had the opportunity to go up and see the ribbon cutting for Recovery Cafe Skagit, uh, an amazing organization doing some great work for folks who are battling a disease called addiction. Uh, you cannot battle addiction alone, uh, or at least not very successfully, and so their model is to battle it in community, if you will. Um, so I would encourage you to look them up, Recovery Cafe Skagit. It's the newest. They have others throughout uh, the region as well. Um, they have one in Everett in particular. Uh, the next day on the 23rd, I already foreshadowed it. I ended up going to Housing Hope or Hope Works groundbreaking here in Edmonds. They have a beautiful new facility that is going to be erected uh, right there in Edmonds, uh, the kind of northeast, northeast corner. Uh, that evening, moving forward, we got too much running commentary here, too late. Uh, Park District Project, um, I had the opportunity to participate in, which is kind of an extension of what we were talking about, about how transit's ch shaping and changing the landscape here. Uh, so up in Everett, because they are the next kind of hub to be impacted with uh, these beautiful light rails coming through. Uh, they're trying to be very intentional about all of their community 
because uh, if it uh, helps uh, your most disenfranchised, it should help your most franchised. Uh, moving forward, on the 24th, I had the honor to slide in at the very end to the uh, Terrace uh, Public Works barbecue, uh, right as Phil was giving his speech, to make it look like I had been there the whole time. Uh, but it looked like a lovely barbecue and just an amazing amount of uh, quality people in that room. So it was an honor to break away from work to share a little bit of space with you all. Uh, that evening, I did participate online with uh, Snohomish County tomorrow, although I just sit and listen. So I'll leave that to our Mayor Pro Tem uh, to run that down. It was a wonderful conversation and lots coming our way. Um, so I'm sure he's got a lot for us there. Uh, on the 25th, and I should warn you, I am going to turn this paper over and keep going. So if you're tired, you should go get a break. Uh, that said, uh, the 25th, I had the opportunity, one of our partners, uh, Economic Alliance of Snohomish County, or Economic Alliance of Snohomish County, I should say, they, they have what's called Snow Code. It's actually a partnership of a lot of folks. Well, they had from Edmonds College, Dr. Yvonne Terrell Powell, uh, do a wonderful talk, uh, an important talk on racial battle fatigue. I suspect that might be recorded if you're interested. I would check EASC's page. Uh, and then later that same day, I had the opportunity to participate in Edmonds College's Memorial Day service. It was their 10th anniversary, and I'm humbled to say I believe I have participated in all 10. Uh, it helped when I was on staff, but nonetheless, I'd, it was wonderful to be in the space and just to honor our veterans. We pushed into that weekend and honored our veterans through Ivy League uh, to uh, work over here in Veterans Park, Memorial Park, and that was another great outing. Uh, you know, we actually have a wide range of folks. Um, our youngest, I'd, I don't think I... No, I didn't give it away. Astrid, I just want to say her name. It's such a beautiful name. But her, she and her dad are almost there every time. And there's some other young folks that are there as well all the time. And so just reminding folks, if you're looking for things to do with your family, come pull some invasive species and some ivy. We would love to have you. No skills required. Good attitude needed. Uh, moving forward, the next day I got to live out a lifelong dream and be on the radio, KSER. I had the opportunity to host co-host a show for a couple hours. It was a lot of fun. It's on my page if you're interested. Uh, I did talk highly of all of you, which is why I bring it into this space. I don't know if you know this, but I love you all. I really do love working with you and you individually as well. You do amazing stuff. Uh, that next day I had the opportunity to hang out with you all at the Hall Creek Groundbreaking, which we were all there for that. Uh, the next day, the 31st, I did get a chance to pop over and say goodbye to Phil and just want to reiterate, Phil, you are an amazing person. Thank you for all the work that you did for this city. And more importantly, from where I sit, thank you for leaving an awesome team behind you uh, and a brand new lead that's going to rock it. So appreciate all the Public Works folks, but Phil in particular, and we miss you already. I uh, Almost done, folks, because you were with me on these last ones, so I'll just power through. On the first Primera tour and the study session, on the second, I had my city manager one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, later that day, I was by myself on this one, but I had the opportunity to go see the Foundation for Edmond School District's Nourishing Network, which is the group that feeds a lot of these students uh, during the summer. Because I think people don't think about what happens when school lets out if my student was getting their meals from school and it's not there anymore. But Nourishing Network in this community steps up to try to make sure that we have all these drop sites. Mount Lake Terrace is one of them, Bicentennial Park. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Rick Larson came down to see what we were doing, was very impressed with all of it, and he says hello. Uh, and then lastly, I will leave it at on Saturday, I had the opportunity to go to a launch for Asian Service Center, and it was just amazing. Uh, they're doing amazing work here. They'd already been doing some great work uh, down south, and this is uh, in kind of an iteration up here is what I would say, but helping folks new to the country uh, get acclimated as quickly as possible because they already are contributors to the planet. Now let's get them contributing to their newest location, in this case, uh, the Pacific Northwest. And that ends my report. Thank you. Um, I'm a little sad I didn't get an ovation, but that's okay. Council Member Salmore, would you like to go next? Yes, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Councilman, um, uh, we had the, our expenditure, expen sorry, I'm going to give a report out on my, um, uh, I'm so sorry, it's a little stressful today, so um, please forgive me. So um, we did have um, our expenditure approval list that was signed this week, and we have another one to go. Um, and then the park and rec and left one um, 
meetings will take place next week. And then just a little bit outside of my report is uh, Verdant did have an open house and I did attend that. And I'm just um, giving you information on that because what they did was they did have the American Heart Association come and they, if you sign up, they would give you six weeks of information on how to improve your heart health. And at the end of that, you do a survey. They also had um, an insurance company there that talked about benefits for seniors. They had another group there that gave out um, seniors um, scholarships. They also were teaching people how to use heart monitors. And one of the things that I, I like the best, which I'm not so good at, is they had cooking classes that are free to our community and you can do them through Zoom as well or attend in person. And that's all I have to report. Thank you. All right, next will be um, Council Member Murray. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would echo our city manager's congratulations to all of our, our high school seniors. Uh, you know, I think that they their perseverance that they have navigated over the last handful of years is incredibly impressive and just want to congratulate them and wish them well as, as they step into this next phase of life. Um, also would echo a big thank you to our chair page and the DEIC for those welcome signs. I know that's been a project you've been working on for quite some time and really excited to see those installed real live and in person and to have our community feel welcomed in, into the spaces and just want to name that that's just another example of the accomplishments of our diversity equity and inclusion commission and the really important and, and good work that they are doing over there um, on may 17th i attended cultural night at the mount lake terrace high school i had a opportunity to uh, learn about uh, lots of different cultures from around the world. Uh, it was a nice opportunity to to see some of our students and community members um, come together in community for, for the first time and share a little bit about themselves uh, and their families and communities. And so I thought that was great and, and hope to see that come back next year uh, with even more uh, support from our, our community. Uh, the next day on the 18th, uh, joined Council Member Woodard at Passport to 2044. So essentially what that was was an opportunity for us as elected officials to learn about the comprehensive planning process which is a, a process that we go through once a decade to think through like what is our vision for our community and how are we ensuring that that comes into you know into fruition as we look forward to the future when we're talking about how we use our land um, what sorts of utilities and transportation we need, et cetera. Um, and so uh, appreciated that opportunity as somebody who has not been through that process to learn more about the process. Um, and also appreciated really the, the, the conversation that they had around stakeholder um, outreach. And I think in particular, uh, youth engagement and, and really thinking through the fact that the folks that are going to experience our communities for the longest period of time are, are the young people. And they talked, they had some intentional work that, that some communities had done around engaging uh, the young, their young folks. And I thought that was a really good flag as we think about um, our strategies uh, for, for our comprehensive planning process here over the next year and a half or so. Um, from there, on the 20th, I had a chance to attend the grand opening of PNT Townhomes by Summit Homes. That was a great opportunity to check out a new development here in our community. They had an amazing food truck uh, that my daughter very much appreciated. Um, and it was just, I mean, the, the development is beautiful. Um, and I will say one of the neat things about it uh, that I hope folks uh, who who potentially are interested uh, find their way to is there is a number of those townhomes that are work live right on 56th so one of our main streets here in Mount Lake Terrace and so it's a really neat opportunity for those who perhaps want a home-based business um, to to find those spaces and so I'm, I'm hopeful that we get some really exciting folks uh, to to open some new businesses there that we can go and visit um, on the 30th uh, was PSRC's General Assembly. It was really neat to go and be in person. I think it was the first time they had had that in person since 2019. 
Um, and so it was an opportunity for folks from across our region, so from Snohomish County and King County and Pierce County and Kitsap County um, to come together, um, elect new leaders, uh, you know, really kind of focus on the, you know, what we can do together as a region when we work together and really thinking through what are those big ideas um, to, to really set ourselves up for future success. Um, and then we had a great presentation um, from a gentleman from an organization called 880 Cities, so 880 Cities. Um, and essentially, his, the, the premise of their organization is that if everything we do in our community is great for eight-year-olds and is great for 80-year-olds, then it will be better for all people. And I thought it was a really interesting concept, particularly as we move into this comprehensive planning process. Um, and I will say it was one that that's, that really like struck home for me. So I have an eight-year-old at home. Um, and so thinking about how he navigates um, our community uh, is really important to me. Um, and I don't know that everybody knows this, but my great-grandmother lived in Mount Lake Terrace and we had her for a very long time. She lived until she was 90. Um, and she never had a car and, and lived here in our community. I live about four blocks from, from where she did. Um, and so it just, it, it definitely, I think, was a really good, like, exercise for me um, and, and would just encourage folks, they recorded the presentation and I'm sure it's available for, for folks to watch. But I think as we think about how are we really enabling all of our community members to thrive and, and be successful in our community, I thought it was just a really simple way to think about it. So um, found a lot of value in that. Um, then raced back to Mount Lake Terrace doing the speed limit, of course, uh, to go to our Hall Creek gr project groundbreaking, um, which again was just such a great opportunity to come together with um, you know city staff who had put in so much work. A big thank you to city staff for all of the work that they've put in to, to get us to a place where we were groundbreaking that project down there. Um, just really, really excited about the environmental impacts and, and the usage impacts for our community as we look forward there. Um, on the first, join the Primera tour, um, which was again was really cool. Like we've known that they've been working on this really amazing campus um, renovation, and it was it was amazing to see. I will say, for folks who are looking for jobs closer to home, their new campus is phenomenal. We got to taste some of the the wonderful food that, that one of their chefs made there. We got to check out their amazing gym uh, and just the outdoor space was beautiful and it was just, it was a really nice opportunity to connect with our largest employer, Mount Lake Terrace, um, who does a lot to invest in our community and the programs that we put on here. And so I appreciated them hosting us and then joined our work session after that. And I think that is it. I will say one last thing I mentioned, uh, so especially since Community Transit was here earlier, I mentioned at our last meeting that it is Ride Transit Month, uh, and that I took the pledge to uh, ride transit at least five times this month. But there's also a bingo card, just in case you're you're interested. And I will say, there's some cool prizes. So I'm going to try to get a bingo uh, before the end of the month, and would encourage others to join me since we've talked about transit so much uh, tonight. So that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Is that for the month of June? Because I already did it all, all more than that in May. <laughs> Okay, so next will be Council Member Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Going back into May, May 16th, Tuesday, attended the Arts Commission meeting where the commission is currently working on the new um, Arts of the Terrace, which several months ahead, but uh, it will be the show will start on September 23rd, and the preview is on that Friday where the council's invited to attend uh, the award winner celebration. And, but the show starts the 23rd and goes to the next uh, Saturday 30th. And then attended uh, works. Shop on June 1st, and that's the end of my report. Thank you, Councilmember Payne Donovan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I guess I'll start at the uh, PSRC training that's been mentioned uh, a handful of times al already, and I want to give kudos to 
Mayor Pro Tem Wall for really repping Mount Lake Terrace quite well and, and doing a, a good job on that panel. Um, after that, I, I also attended the PNT Townhomes uh, grand opening event on May 20th and would echo Councilmember Murray's uh, wishes for cute little businesses there in those live work spaces on 56th. Um, after that, on May 24th, I also dropped in at the Public Works uh, and Operations uh, barbecue, which was a good time and had some, had some delicious food. On the 30th, I also was at the Hall Creek Project groundbreaking, which was terrific to, to see get started. Following that, I, I also attended the Primera tour. And um, then on June 2nd, um, I filled in for you, Mayor, on the Seashore Transportation Forum, um, where there was a presentation from the um, Sound Transit CEO, as well as from uh, WashDOT. And I just wanted to, to share, you know, I think we've, we've got the latest and greatest from, from Sound Transit, but I, I did um, have a chance to, sh to share our, our collective frustrations. I hope it's, it's fair to say about um, the, the issue of uh, bathroom access at our incoming uh, light rail station. Um, CEO uh, Tim's uh, shared with, in response, shared that there is within Sound Transit at a, at a staff level um, some policy being developed about future bathroom use um, at, at light rail stations. Um, she couldn't promise that, you know, when it might come before the board, but um, did want to share that out with, with this group. And, and she, she said, I think, as it's potentially something that could be, be coming before the Sound Transit Board sometime late this year. And then I um, also wanted to report out that um, you know, the, the WashDOT uh, project managers who were, were sharing updates about their sort of, uh, the package of projects that they're calling Revive I-5, most of which will, will be further south down, down Interstate 5. Um, but they, they um, did mention the um, removal of the the, um, I guess it's not Hall Creek on the south side of Lake Ballinger. It is uh, McAleer Creek, um, but the McAleer Creek culvert that runs from the southern outflow of Lake Ballinger down to Lake Washington um, could begin construction as early as 2026, which could have some um, impacts to, um, you know, I-5 and, and uh, Mount Lake Terrace. Um, so that, those are, that's the substantive report out I have on that. And with, with that, I will wrap. Well, I'm glad you made it. It's one of my favorite meetings. <laughs> I don't know why. Good vibes. Uh, Mayor for Tim Wall. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, all right, so on the 16th, I attended a reception held uh, by Future Sound Regional Council for the America's Competitiveness Exchange. You may recall I mentioned that before that uh, the America's Competitiveness Exchange is uh, an organization uh, for the Americas, North and South America. And we had 130 officials from, uh, from around both continents here in the Puget Sound region, and we were, had the opportunity to showcase uh, the Puget Sound region, and, and particularly that night, that day, that full day in Snohomish County, and sharing all the exciting things and projects we have going on up in this region. Uh, the next, let's see, on the 18th, I was a panelist on the Passport for, to 2044. We've talked a little bit about that, and you're going to be hearing a lot of, have been hearing a lot about the comprehensive plan update process for 2024, and you're going to be hearing a lot more about that. Um, but this is an opportunity for some training for our, our elected officials and, and uh, planning commissioners from around the region uh, to help, help all, all of us understand the role of elected officials and the, our officials, uh, what, we're, what to expect, some of the challenges we're going to be facing, what we're hearing from our citizens, our community uh, around the area. Um, 
and, and I can't emphasize enough what an opportunity this is for us to shape what Mount Lake Terrace is going to look like in 20 years. So it's really important for us to come together as a community and provide our ideas throughout this process. And we're going to be talking soon about the public uh, participation uh, plan for for the city and we've got the R, you know the RFP and this gone out and we're going to be getting some uh, the team together and talking about what we're what we expect and we've already heard a little bit about the the potential for citizens commission and opportunities for our citizens to participate and in addition to our youth I also want to mention during the the session and highly encourage anybody that has diversity and equity and inclusion commissions to be sure to include them in this process give the, that body an opportunity to look at uh, what uh, what plans are coming together for the future of their communities and so particularly for our community in Mount Lake Terrace I uh, want to be sure that we're inviting our, our DEIC to be involved in that process and have some input and, and sharing their ideas on how we're going to shape this community into the future um, I could go on, as you know, but I'll stop there because I need to get outside to thaw out. <laughs> uh, but uh, because I still have way too much to go. On the 24th, the mayor and the city manager and I were in D.C. to meet with our congressional delegation. I had a very successful trip there to talk about our projects and the, the partnership that we have with our federal de delegation and, and the opportunities we have to work together to help build a better community here in Mount Lake Terrace and what they're doing uh, to, to bring some help for the projects, particularly uh, Main Street and where we're at in the process of, of uh, congressional allocations, uh, earmarking uh, some dollars from Mount Lake Terrace as well as the status of the raise grant and being able to get substantial dollars coming our way in the future hopefully, uh, to help us finish off Main Street. Um, anyway, later that evening, while in D.C., zoomed into the Snohomish County tomorrow's steering committee meeting, uh, where we had a legislative update and primarily had a very lengthy and somewhat controversial uh, discussion about the HO5 report uh, doing the housing targets for, uh, for Snohomish County. And as, the, you know, I think the biggest challenge that we, we've got a lot of challenges, a lot of opportunities and, and things to do to help shape our community. The biggest challenge I think we're going to have is that we need to plan for, so this is the big change in the planning. We need to now plan for all economic segments, which is, it's, it's, it's going to be hugely difficult for all of us to do, but it's something that's necessary. We've needed to do this for a long time, and this is an opportunity for us to do it and do it right. Uh, plan right, plan better. You know, we talk about, we, about the surveys that have been done and how housing is now the number one issue in this area for all of us to address. And we need to do it, and we need to do it better. And we uh, need to step up. Local governments need to step up all across the region to do a better job in providing for a, more choices and more affordability in housing. This is uh, but it is going to be difficult. I mean, for here in Mount Lake Terrace, 25% of what we need to plan for between now and 2044 is going to be for the 0 to 30%, so subsidized housing. We need to figure out how we're going to fit 25% of, of the additional growth that's coming for subsidized housing. And how, and so we need to do that, do that well, and then 21% for 30 to 80%, 18% to 80 for 120%. So well over fifth, half of the additional housing needs to be affordable. And it's going to be hard for us to figure out how to do that, but we need to do it. And we're going to need to work together as a community to figure out how to do it right and how it's going to work best for all of us. Um, Again, I could go on, but I will spare you all for tonight because we're going to be having, we've got a year and a half to work through this. But that was, that was a, a, a difficult challenge for all of our cities. And we're, and we're one, of the, one of the cities that's actually stepping up and willing, willingly taking part in doing this uh, exercise in, in planning, whereas we have almost, I mean, we barely passed that. I mean, it was an eight to six vote. Um, and 
not that there was a choice because we have to do it. A legal obligation by the state to plan for all economic segments of, uh, of our society. So, uh, but you've got, here in Snohomish County, we've got a lot of jurisdictions that aren't even interested or willing in, to do it. I won't point out anybody just now, but um, it's public record, so take a look. Um, anyway, we're, we've, we've got a lot of work to head, a lot of opportunities, but some challenges that uh, it's gonna take some work to get through. Okay, so let's see, where was I? On, uh, sorry, I can get a little carried away on planning, can't I? Uh, let's see, on the, I haven't gotten to the next one. <laughs> anyway, all right, so, the uh, 30th, I already mentioned, so I won't go into much detail other than the Puget Sound Regional Council General Assembly, where we adopted our budget and work plan for the next couple of years, elected new officers, including our uh, very own executive Summers, is going to be the vice president for the next two years, which then will lead to the president uh, of the Puget Sound Regional Council. On the 30th, we had the Howell Creek groundbreaking. Uh, again, exciting project. We've talked about it, but and kudos to everybody that's been involved in, the, in, in that um, exciting times for our, our own community and, and Lake Ballinger and, and the prospects for Hall Creek and moving forward and getting that accomplished by the end of the year, uh, which is huge, so, and great work. And again, you know, we're one of the few cities in the country that can say thank you to the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, so many others are, are uh, other cities around the country are more frustrated with uh, with working together with them, but I, we can proudly say that uh, we're, we've got a great partnership with them, and we're very happy to have their their work and help uh, to get to where we are and where we're going with Hall Creek. Okay, so then more planning. Sorry, Puget Sound Regional Council Growth Board meeting on the first. We had a let's uh, update or recap actually. So details on that. Let's see if I can see this without my eyes. Um, First of all, there is a lot of money that is available. We need to be, I see our planning folks have already stepped out, so Jeff, be sure to make sure, be working together with our uh, planning team to, re, to access a lot of money for planning. We got $2.3 million for the middle housing legislation that was adopted. We've got um, another $40.9 million that is available for communities addressing climate change, climate element in our, a comprehensive plan. There is three and a half million dollars for consolidating our local permit review process. And what else am I missing? Another plan, another five, six million dollars for planning for housing, two and a half million for salmon recovery efforts, 400 million for, uh, oh, sorry, 400 million dollars is going to the housing trust fund uh, to help us with affordable housing. Then we've got $80 million for the connecting affordable housing projects with utilities and $40 million for land acquisition, land acquisition for affordable housing. So a lot of, a lot of potential opportunities for us to be uh, and, uh, tapping into and particularly utilize, utilizing those grants. So on the middle housing, that legislation did pass, as we know, that is, needs to be adopted and incorporated into our plans by July 2025. The ADUs, which requires an additional uh, two, uh, so on the middle housing, just a reminder, that is requiring communities our size to provide, ensure at least duplexes are available in all single family re uh, residential zoning. Um, and then for a, additional dwelling units, that also passed, that is two units uh, requiring every, anywhere we have additional dwelling units to allow for up to two units of additional dwelling units. Um, the climate element passed, the, uh, anyway, okay, so there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of opportunities for us to be able to tap into some dollars for us that, uh, to, to help us in our comprehensive planning update and, and uh, planning for more housing. So let's be sure to utilize that. Um, I think that's the main thing for the growth board that we talked about was yeah, the, the legislation in the past and what requirements we've got to deal with. So then on the first, we also had the Primera Tour. Again, I mean, this, is, this campus is amazing. I mean, it's already, we've already talked a little bit about it. But I mean, it, it made me think of 
Google and Amazon campuses and how well they are taking care of their employees with the space that they're providing, the workspace that they're providing. And Premier is on that level. I mean, they just did a great, do it, did a great job in, in redeveloping their campus. There's still more to come, uh, but they've, they've got a great campus that really are taking care of their employees. So yeah, if you want a, if you want a job with Premier, this is, this is a great, great uh, job opportunity there. They do great work and proud, we're proud to have them as our largest employer in the city. Uh, also on the first, we had our work session. Then earlier today, we had our meeting with the mayor and I had a meeting with the city manager and I will conclude my report there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So my report, uh, I'll go back to May 20th. I also went to the Summit Homes Open House uh, for the townhomes, and I really like the variety of the different types of townhomes we're getting uh, in our city. Um, and then on the 22nd, I attended the Snohomish County Mayor's meeting, and that's for all of Snohomish County, the mayors of all of Snohomish County. And um, on the 23rd, um, I was, oh, I guess I was on the um, Economic Alliance of Snohomish County panel on housing with um, Mark Smith and Chris Collier. And um, lot, lots of good things coming out um, on that panel. So if you haven't watched it, um, please do, because I, um, and I actually watched it because I can't even, couldn't remember what I said. And, um, right. <laughs> so, um, lots of good ideas about affordable housing and, and so forth, and there's more coming up. On the 24th, I, attend, um, I went to uh, Washington, D.C. with our um, city manager and our mayor pro tem, and we met with um, Congresswoman Lar uh, Congressman Larson, Congresswoman Del Bene, and uh, a staff at, the, um, at Patty Murray's office, Senator Murray. Um, we have such a great relationship with our Congress people, and I, I just, um, I think we're very, very lucky, and uh, they actually listen to us, and they want to help us. And they've, it's been like this for quite a few years, all of the time that Congressman Larson was our uh, congressman and now with Susan Del Bene. So hopefully um, we're gonna start getting um, funds again. And on uh, the 30th, I attended the Gen uh, PSRC General Assembly. Um, and again, that was great. Um, I, I never got off the International District light rail station before. So it's, it's nice for me now to be getting off at different light rail stations. And I, I think I've now gotten off at about half of them. Um, let's see. And then I attended, right after that, I attended the um, Hall Creek groundbreaking and what a, what a great ceremony that was. And I'm glad that so many uh, council members showed up. Um, on the 31st, I attended the goodbye party for uh, Phil Williams. Um, and it just really shows you, oh, even though he was our interim temporary, um, he touched so many people's lives that they were all there. The staff was all there, smiling, happy, and, um, and actually sad to see him go. And then on the first, I attended uh, the community transit uh, board meeting, and I had to leave early for that because I had to go to the tour, our Primera, comp, um, Primera tour campus. And we are really, really lucky to have them as our um, in our city, um, as as our again, a lot of people have said our largest employer, and I uh, I think they're going to stay in our city. So we're lucky, and that is the end of my report. All right. So anyone have any questions or comments on anyone else's reports before we could go on? Ask me a question about the conference if I can. Go ahead. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Next is new uh, business. Does anyone have any new business? Co um, Council Member Woodard. Thank you. I'll keep it quick. And I, I apologize. I could have added it a second ago when you said any comments. I, I need to modify my report. Uh, you triggered my thought. I also participated in your coffee talk. You did an amazing job. Thank you for representing Mount Lake Terrace. Uh, that was the Economic Alliance coffee chat ah. on the 23rd. I also uh, 
I listened to you in my ear as I was driving to the groundbreaking as I stopped, as the last one over here at the um, plaza, MLT Plaza on the 23rd, they had a wonderful setup of breakfast burritos and popcorn and some other stuff. I don't know how well it was attended, unfortunately, which is uh, neither here nor there because it's in the past, uh, but did want to thank them for thinking of our community that way and let them know. I did make a post and it was the uh, most likes I've ever gotten on the Mountain Lake Terrace page. It was well over 100 likes. Unfortunately, by the time they posted it, it was over, and that's a whole other discussion about moderators and all that. But nonetheless, thank you to the MLT Plaza and the seniors over there and the staff for feeding our community, or at least giving that valiant effort to do so. It was a great burrito. Well, I'm sorry I missed that, but we had to go to the airport. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Wow. I guess we're done. Next on agenda is adjournment. We're adjourned. Recording stopped.